Howdy folks and welcome to the Daily Coin and my name is Rory and I have on the line Mr. Alistair McLeod who I met through SGT Report where I'm a daily contributor. It's a real pleasure to speak with Alistair and we're going to cover the HSBC vaults, China's desire to, and we're going to get into the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and we're going to touch on Greece and Russia and China, what's happening there. Without any further ado, Mr. Alistair McLeod. The article that you put out on Friday, my goodness. Yes, it's interesting, isn't it? It Um, is very interesting. I think, yeah, it, it's, it is very interesting. I mean, there, there are big, big changes happening in London now. And uh, I don't think people have really woken up to the implications. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, there is a new, um, uh, if you like, um, dealing platform, which is going to operate between the fixes. Uh, now, this is a commercial enterprise, which may or may not take off. But uh, from what little I've seen of it, it's actually quite a... Um, a you know, a sort of a considered operation, and it's it's covering a number of centres around the world. So it'll be going, it'll be trading twenty four hours a day, wow. and I think, I mean, just sort of reading the literature, it seems to me that they've they've made um, uh, an effort to get liquidity onto the platform by getting sort of major particip- participations or participants into it. Now that's desperately important because. If you can get liquidity on the platform, then existing players in the market can use it as a means of hedging. You know, if they've got to deliver physical, they know they can go and get physical off this, this exchange. Um, the other thing is that it introduces a wider range of, um, uh, of, of players, if you like, of investors, whatever you like to call them, um, uh, into the market. So that should, in time, create net buyers. So I would see it as a positive for the, for, uh, the market on that basis, as well as um, uh, providing better physical liquidity, if you like. That sounds awesome. If there's more buyers in in the market and there's, there's more people that are trading back and forth, actually, then that has yep. to be positive for the health of the market and to be able to wash out some of this, you know, rigging. I mean, this, you yep. know, quantifiable, it's, it's, rigged markets yeah i think i think i think that's the point i mean we you know we um you and i and various others we all sort of know that the whole system is rigged um but the degree of rigging that actually occurs in the gold market is always impossible to quantify by definition um and uh, but now we have a situation where the pricing power is being taken away from the establishment let me put it that way um, what now matters, certainly on the fixes, is the deepest pocket. Exactly. Not, not, not who you are. I mean, if you remember the fixing committee, all the the, um, uh, um, the, the gold dealing business on the fix uh, would come through 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 you. You would see is exactly what's going on. You would see that the Bank of China is buying at the moment, or not buying, or what their limits are. Their behavior in the fix, whether with they withdraw from the fix at a certain level. Now, that's information which is invaluable to you as a trader in the market. And, uh, you know, at the moment, until the 20th of March, only four people have got this information. And it allows them to have an edge in the market, which, um, uh, in terms of a fair uh, uh, and open market, is obviously fundamentally wrong. Yes. But now we, ha- now we have a situation where it's deepest pockets, and the deepest pockets by far are the Chinese. And what, I, what I've been thinking about this morning, Alistair, and help me to understand this. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a buyer in the eastern market, Yep. and I see that, that gold is currently trading, you know, at, at, at 12.05 uh, and 30 cents. Yeah. I decided that that I'm okay with paying twelve seventy five an ounce. Would I be yep. able to do that and then and put those contracts out there? Well, you wouldn't. You, you wouldn't do that. Basically, what you would do is um, you try and buy. I mean, if you're a genuine buyer, you try and buy them as cheaply as possible. 
So if you think that gold is wildly undervalued, then you just buy it. You buy what you can until you bid it up to the level which you think uh, um, is, is, is where you'd want to stop. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, the same for sellers as well. I mean, we mustn't look at this as just on one side. The problem is that we have very few sellers left right. um, in, in, in Europe. And um, the, the second bomb, I think, which you might be referring to is, is, I think, evidence of this to a degree anyway. And that is that HSBC uh, appear to be, now I haven't had this actually confirmed from HSBC yet, but they appear to be closing uh, seven of their vaults in London. That's what now, I was referring to. Yeah, I think, I mean, the, the there is little doubt in my mind that uh, running vaults uh, in London is no longer a profitable business. And the reason for that basically is the gold has gone. Um, it's been bought by the Asians. And so anything that's been in London is either held in the Bank of England's vault um, or has already been shipped to somewhere like Argo Jerez for recasting into one kilogram bars for the Chinese market. So um, there has to come a point where excess vault capacity is even more excess than it was um, a little while ago. We already we've already seen Deutsche Bank have sold their vault. Oh, sorry, they've been they've been trying to sell their vault. I don't know if they've actually found a seller. I don't think they have actually. And uh, J.P. Morgan, um, they had a vault. I understand uh, in uh, John Carpenter Street, which um, is between um, the Inns of Court and the City by Blackfriars. Now that site has been redeveloped, so that vault must be closed. I mean, that can't can't be there anymore. Uh, so it's it's it has been a changing scene, and I think what London has seen is that in the bull market of two thousand and nine to two thousand and eleven, there was uh, definitely a huge increase in interest in um, uh, holding physical gold, and as a result, uh, vault capacity began to be ramped up. Uh, now um, it's gone the other way, and it's been going the other way for two or three years. Um, you had the withdrawal, if you like, from the market of people like ABN AMRO and Rabobank, um, who um, uh, told their clients that they were they, they were unable to deliver in gold. And that happened just before the April two thousand and thirteen smashdown, um, and I think was probably one of the reasons for the smashdown. But anyway, getting back to HSBC, the reason this is very very important is that. Um, if they're closing their vaults in, the, in London, we need to know the status of the GLD um, bars, which they hold as custodian. And also, um, I mean, I'm sure there are other ETF um, uh, uh, physicals that they, that, 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 that they operate for as custodian. One of them is ETF securities, for example. So um, there is, I mean, you're talking about, I don't know how much there is between the two now, something like a thousand tons of gold, which has got, um, you know, if they're withdrawing from vaulting completely, that's got to find a new, a new custodian. So um, we want to know whether the closing of the vaults also affects those uh, custody operations. That's that's something we're waiting for. I haven't seen anything on this. I have actually been in contact with HSBC trying to get an answer out of them. I've been con in contact with ETF Securities, and they tell me that um, HSBC are uh, preparing an announcement. Now, that I think is worrying because, um, firstly, if they are preparing an announcement as opposed to denying the rumours, then it confirms that they are doing something like closing their vaults. Um, the fact that they are preparing an announcement and not prepared to say anything, um, I mean, if the custody arrangements for um, a, an ETF like ETF Securities um, were not being changed, then um, on the inquiry from ETF Securities, to HSBC because they did ask they did ask um, uh, uh, HSBC this morning. Fine, you know what the hell's going on, sort of thing, <laughs> because they had got people like me getting on of them saying, hey, "Boy, you know." Um, and uh, HSBC, you know, HSBC said we are preparing announcement. They did not say to them, so far as I can establish, that um, uh, we're preparing an announcement. But don't worry, you're all right. 
<laughs> well, what's, do you see, it's a very yes. important point. Yeah. So uh, this this worries me. Now, it worries me on another level, and that is I'm not too sure what other custodians there are who can take on the vaulting of 1,000 tons of gold in London. I mean, our JP, JP Morgan could do it, um, but, you know, are they in the market? Now, the, the next worry that I get from this is that if, the, if they can't find a custodian, then uh, certainly an ETF securities prospectus, they have to liquidate the fund. If, um, this, if, this is, if this happens with GLD, I would assume that they would also have to liquidate the, the fund, which basically means that uh, there would be gold dumped on the market and a lot of ETF holders extremely angry. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the uh, I suppose the conspiracy theorist in me sort of uh, thinks, is this a way in which you can get a lot of physical gold? Now, I, you know, th these, these are all open questions at this moment in time. We've got no evidence that this is actually what's going to happen or there is a plan or anything like that. Right. But I think this is, it is a situation which should be of sufficient concern uh, for the authorities here to actually uh, intervene and make sure that an orderly market uh, is I mean, that the, the market is kept, if you like, in an orderly fashion, and to ensure that proper arrangements are in place, not um, a situation where HSBC walks away from it, gives, in the case of GLD, I think it's 60 days notice. In the case of ETF securities, it's 90 days notice. Um, walks away and says, you make your own arrangements, we're not interested. That is not good enough. No, I wouldn't think so. And I wanted to ask you, I want to use that number that you threw out a minute ago with a thousand tons that could possibly be in the GLD and the uh, ETF. Yeah. Hypothetically I, say they are closed. They're getting ready to uh, unleash this thousand tons on the market with. Well, China. well, I'm not sure that they will unleash it, unleash it on the market. I mean, <laughs> you know, basically um, if, if you're closing, if, you know, if if they if they if if they're closing um, uh, vaults generally, then I think that they have a shortage of physical. Right. They need to get their books straight, and I mean, I'm just sort of again, I'm theorising and probably going way off the deep end here, <laughs> but you've got you've got the new fixing arrangement from 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 the twentieth of this month. Um, you've got a short position. Uh, and, uh, you know, the mines are closing. So forward contracts and all the rest of it to cover today's liabilities are harder to come by. Um, you know, there's just a shortage of physical in the West. And suddenly this market is going legit. What do you do if you're part of, you know, if you're part of the establishment? It's a problem. It doesn't I make, think. that doesn't make any sense. Don't you find it interesting that as London has decided to relinquish their their the reins of the fix that HSBC makes this announcement all all of these within just a, a few days of each other and on top well, on top of that then you have this you have over in China or actually in Bangkok you have these uh, at least one billboard has shown up over there announcing the RMB as the world currency. I mean, there's this gigantic billboard that uh, Simon Black over at Sovereign Man took a photograph of, or he presented a photograph of it, and it shows, and it, it clearly states, RMB, new choice, the world currency, and it has an image of what appears to be a gold coin. And that showed up middle of last week, and you have the the International Commodity Exchange's trading platform announcing that they're coming out on March the 20th and HSBC announcing that they're closing, possibly closing, you know, all of their gold vaults. Isn't that well, right? The, the, uh, or the first thing I would seven. say is, yeah, we, we, we do not have an announcement yet from HSBC. Okay. All I have got from HSBC is hearsay. Um, Andrew McGuire uh, said something about it on King World News. 
I got uh, an email from a contact who told me that his bullion broker has been given notice. So, you know, th there is, if you like, evidence that this is happening, but I haven't got an announcement out of HSBC. And I would really want to wait to see that announcement before I can really, you know, get two and two equals four. At the moment, I, you know, I'm in danger of making two and two equals six, <laughs> as we all are. But, you know, the, I mean, I think we've just got to sort of, um, you know, rein in a little bit and say, you know, we need to see that announcement. That's, that's the first thing. Con you know, HSBC have either got to confirm or deny it. And if they're confirming that they're closing vaults, we need some detail as to exactly what they're doing and what the status is of the ETFs. Okay. Now that, I think, is desperately important. <laughs> but beyond that, yes, you're right. You're absolutely right. Um, you know, the, I, I was not surprised at that advertisement in Bangkok. I really was not surprised because I have been expecting the Chinese to continue to build the um, renminbi as a settlement currency. Now, they can't use the renminbi everywhere. They don't want it to be a reserve currency which is, is, is a very important point. Therefore, they're not turning around and saying to us in the West, look, what we want to do is we want to replace the dollar. That's not what they're saying. What they're saying is that we would prefer that you trade with us. Now, in order for us to prefer to trade with them, then at some stage, we're going to want to have some um, comfort, if you like, that renminbi are worth holding as a currency. Now, this is where gold comes in. Okay. I don't know when, I don't know how, but somehow there has got to be a link, I think, to give the renminbi a level of credibility in cross-border trade, which uh, make, places it above the dollar. And I think that gold is, obvious, is the obvious link for this. I think it can be done. And the reason it can be done is that um, the, I mean, it's, Sorry, let me take a step back. Okay. If you go back to 2002, the, the, the charter of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization was um, implemented. And that, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, is a joint deal between Russia and China where they share security intelligence. So, you know, the, the, you know, the, the people who try and assassinate people and throw bombs and all the rest of it, they exchange information. It then moved on to, um, uh, you know, sort of cross-border trade and um, infrastructure projects and things like that. And the last thing that they want to put in place is uh, to get away from the dollar. Now, I put it that way simply because from the point of view of the Chinese and the Russians, Every deal they do in dollars is reflected in a bank account in New York. Now, this is valuable information for, um, we can now almost call America an enemy, if you like, from their point of view. Not so much from the Chinese point of view, but yeah, yeah, because of, yes. you know, they are disputing territory in, in the South China Sea. Yes. Um, and, and what we are seeing is we're seeing the establishment of this huge, great block. And it's a trading block. It's an economic block. Um, it's only a political block in the sense that um, they are sharing common interests, and the common interests really are about trade. It's not a political block in the sense that the EU is, where you know they're trying over time to get the Germans to to, to drink French wine and the, and the French to eat breakfast or whatever, you know, whatever the scheme is. You know, I mean, they're not trying to homogenize everybody. Right. What they're trying to do is just trade. And Russia has got the resources. China has got the manufacturing capability. This is a plan that has been in the making now since uh, 1980. So if you, if, you, if you put all this together, what you have is um, a huge great trading area, which when India joins, and India is, is, um, has agreed that they will join, along with Pakistan, deadly enemy, believe, believe it or not, over, over Kashmir, Afghanistan and Mongolia, when those countries join, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization will cover more than half the world's population. Yep. This is enormously powerful. 
If you go back 10 years, um, you know, when this, when all this was sort of um, uh, just starting and, you know, the Chinese and Beijing were getting very excited about it, but we in the West were yawning and saying, well, <laughs> well, uh, yeah, this is just nonsense. Um, uh, you know, in a sense, it didn't matter to us because all these people were poor, you know, but now they're rich. They're yeah. the new rich. They are getting richer and we're getting poorer. We're getting poorer because we're being taxed to, to, to death. And they're getting richer because they're actually trading. They're doing things. Um, they're interested not, you know, when they turn up to trade, they don't sort of start telling you how to behave. And then, oh, by the way, we could sell you some um, fridges or something. No. You know, they come over and they just say, you want a deal? Yes. <laughs> you know, Let's conduct they, business. That there's no there's no conditionality attached. It's a very, very different approach from ours, which has just got, tied up in um oh sort of i don't know some sort of you know ethics morality whatever whatever, whatever. i mean we're, 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 we have a we have a completely different outlook on life from that part of the world but what this means coming back to the currency is they want to get away from some of the perceived problems that we have in developing their future the Chinese aren't fools. They can see what's happening to Western currencies. Exactly. They can, they can see what's likely to happen to their own currency. Um, but you know that that is something they've got to control. And uh, you know, certainly, I would be worried about the Chinese economy because of the amount of credit around. I mean, it is a bubble economy, and the history of of governments controlling the deflation of uh, bubbles is not a happy history. Um, and the idea that the Chinese can manage it, I think, you know, wh whereas we can't, um, I think is actually kind of mistaken. And I think this is going to be put to the test. So, um, you know, the world is not easy. And I think the path towards a sound currency in China is not easy either. It can be done. But what they would have to do is they would have to completely reject the Keynesian economic approach that the West has got itself completely hooked on. But aren't they, and aren't they moving they, away from that? Well, I mean, know, as far as the, I mean, Russia has implemented the, the alternative to the SWIFT system. There's somewhere around 90 plus uh, banks that are already on board with that. China, as part of the BRICS, and both of them are, are part of the BRICS, have opened up the Shanghai Development Bank. That's two huge components of moving away from the dollar uh, hegemony, or right? I mean, so they're so they've got two massive components to be able to do that and to be able to work in in concert with, have the BRICS and the SCO work in concert with each other, and it just seems like that that their their plan is coming together, and it seems to be moving moving along at a pace that that may not make it may be the reason for the aggression that we're seeing out of Washington DC towards Russia through Ukraine I mean would you um mm, yeah it's I, I don't know I think you're you're, you're um waiting in, in thin waters <laughs> no 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 no, no. I, I wouldn't say that Rory I, I think you're probably attributing too much common sense to oh. um, our leaders <laughs> um uh, coming back, coming back to your basic point about how um, the, the Chinese and the Russians, you know, sort of show signs, if I can put it this way, of not really accepting Keynesianism. I think that's true generally. Um, in the case of China, I worry slightly about, uh, you know, how they make credit available, how they've puffed up the whole thing on this sort of sea of credit. Um, I'm not convinced they really know what they're doing and that they uh, and that they can handle that credit bubble. Um, that was my basic point. Okay. Now, having said that, they haven't actually, um, uh, uh, if you like, sort of been tutored in uh, Keynesian economics from the outset. I mean, if you if you've got uh, um, you know sort of the wise heads, if you like, if I can call them that, in the Communist Party who are who are coming up with the five year plans. Um, the, the, you know, they they didn't go to an Ivy League university. Let's put it that way. <laughs> now, in Russia is interesting because um, uh, the uh, 
the, the governor of the Russian Central Bank, uh, Elvira Nubliana, I think she's called. Before that, she was um, Putin's um, private economic advisor. Now, uh, the indications I have are that she's probably um, somewhere towards the Austrians in terms of her thinking rather than towards the Keynesians. Now, I, I, I say that slightly with my tongue in cheek because it's 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 difficult to get a handle on what people in a position of power actually think because they you know if you are if you're an austrian economist i know one very prominent austrian economist in a position in a central bank which is very very major but you would never never ever think that that person is an austrian economist from his speeches and from his writings and so on and so forth i just happen to know what his um, university history was, which tells me that he was an economist. Uh, he is an Austrian, but you know, when you're in the position in a central bank, you cannot, cannot admit to being an Austrian economist because you are so far against the grain that immediately you're rejected <laughs> from your position. <laughs> now, um, this this is this is true if you like within a central bank in the in in the West, but I think it is also true in the world which is run by the IMF and all the rest of it. Now, to a degree, I think that the new BRICS bank gets away from that. Uh, the proof of it getting away, we will see if um, they restrict what they're doing, not to bailing out countries, but effectively to trade deals. That's it's a very important distinction yes. because what the IMF does, it doesn't have anything to do with trade. What they do is they bail out countries that are in difficulty. They just strap them with more debt. Absolutely. And I think at this BRICS bank, if, if, if their approach is, look, you know, this, okay, th 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 we'd like to trade with this country, um, you know, it's, it's, it's part of our club, as it were. Um, uh, we, will make it, we, we will make money available to them to trade, but we're not going to bail them out. I think if we see, if we see not quite black and white, but if we see the emphasis towards trade, then I will know, we will all know that there is a more Austrian approach, um, an Austrian come mercantilist approach, if you like, to the to to this new BRICS bank compared with the IMF. And I think that's a very important distinction. So it'll be interesting to see. It will be, and and I think that what they what the plan is, and I, I don't know that they have anything spearheaded or that they've got anything on, in line at this point because i mean they've just they they've just agreed on the funding between the five of them i have been of the understanding that uh, that it was specifically for development for items like railroad lines or infrastructure of you know water systems or uh, grid systems or something that would benefit not only the country where it is but benefit that it would open up pipelines to other countries as well, as far as yeah. the trade, like what you were talking about. Absolutely, I, I, that, that's that's how I would see it. Um, and uh, I mean, we, we've we've got, for example, China is uh, spending is it something like fifty billion dollars equivalent on uh, the new Silk Road? Yes. Um, you know, and this is meant to be a huge, huge um, infrastructure link, if you like. Uh, tying together the whole of Asia, I mean, this is this is and and you know sort of getting <laughs> getting Asian goods as far as, uh, as as far as Europe. I mean this is this is a, a major major infrastructure pro project and uh, makes so much sense. And it makes sense in the context of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Um, and if you if you think of the power of Russia with her resources. China with her manufacturing capability. What she's doing, what they're doing is that they've used us in the West, if you like, as um, uh, the stepping stone to develop the capability for the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. You know, they make they, they started off making cheap goods for us. They've made progressively um, uh, more technologically sophisticated goods for us. I mean, all the Apple stuff and all the rest of it is all made there, for example. Um, and uh, they will continue to trade for us. But they see their future basically developing their own market, which is the whole of Asia and as much of Eastern Europe as they can grab hold of, which is why the C Ukraine is so important. That's why it's the, it's the battleground, if you like, between NATO and, uh, and Russia. 
um, you know, we're looking at this. We can see we can see what they're doing. Uh, right. China China has not only got um, uh, you know all the the uh, if you like the American aligned um, uh, nations to the south. You know, like um, oh the Philippines, uh, Indonesia, um, you know, Malaysia, and all the rest of them. I mean, all those countries have big Chinese populations. You know. It, culturally they're already there they don't have to be included but they're already there we have the same situation if you go to the west of this whole conurbation and look at the baltic states and look at um eastern poland and the ukraine obviously and moldova and all these places you've got all the links there they don't have to take them all over but what russia wants is it wants security because Russia's history has been one of, um, you know, invasion, and um, it's it's always been the prime fear. And and you know, the successful Tsars in the past are the ones who have been able to protect uh, Russian territory. And I think Putin sees that as as being very very important. So, if there is, um, it, you know, if any common sense comes into this, I think that once uh, the non-Russian part of the Ukraine uh, is properly neutral. Then I think Putin will will be happy with that compromise. I think that the Baltic states they are very very worried about they're just next you know they're going to be the next ones to be invaded. Putin doesn't have to do that. He, don't, he really doesn't have to do that. And I don't think that's really where his interest lies. So all in all, it's um, you know I think what we're seeing is we are seeing the uh, assembly of um, a brand new economic block which. Um, is going to dominate the world. I mean, literally, um, the rest of us are now also around. Uh, I think America is roughly where Britain was um, in the sort of thirties. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, the the glory is fading fast, <laughs> very fast. <laughs> I'm sorry to say, I'm sorry to say that to an American, but it, no, it's, it's you know, I think I, I think our behaviour is very much on the back foot too. You know, it, it's um, uh, we, we just you know we're losing. Um, and yes. when you're losing, <laughs> you know how difficult it is to get sort of back into a winning position. What? And uh, my goodness, America's struggling trying to do it with NATO and, you know, partners who are getting reluctant to, to play this game uh, in Europe. I mean, like Germany, for example. Right. Um, and it's, it's almost like anything you do just doesn't bloody work. I mean, like, um, uh, you know, <laughs> you suddenly find you're accused, probably rightly, of... Um, uh, of of bugging Angela Merkel's telephone, <laughs> you know, and uh, yeah, and this this I mean this, this this just just makes you enemies. I you know it uh, anything like that suddenly is, and and uh, you know some junior guy called Snowden who you've never heard of ends up you know <laughs> blowing apart all your signals intelligence, and uh, you know this this is an absolute nightmare. But it is I'm afraid typical I think of. Um, an empire in decline you know it's just that uh you know it's all fragmenting basically all fragmenting yep and and speaking of which i want to the last last thing i want to uh, ask you about is is greece and mm. and it ties into russia and what you've been saying and as we have read in the you know recently that russia had approached Greece to help them with their finances. And yeah. we know that we know, you know, I know, the whole world knows that China is accustomed to making deals with people that benefit their long term plans. Yeah. Would you see Greece? And it's no secret that Russia wants to, wants Greece to be part of possibly the new Silk Road. China possibly wants sees that as a as an inroads as well. Is that even a possibility, or am I way well, out in the weeds here? It is a possibility, but it's not. It, it's it's not an easy. It's it, it, it's it's not an easy deal. Um, for start, you've got to think of the relationship between Greece and Turkey. I mean, basically, they still hate each other, <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, Turkey is sort of going its own way. They've got their local sort of minor version of Putin, if you like. Um, uh, but Turkey, Turkey, interestingly, they um, 
uh, they want to join the the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Um, you know, they put down their marker to go and join. Uh, and uh, before then, I mean, before this chap Edrigan came in, it, uh, it was elected as prime minister whenever it was, um, Turkey was trying desperately to get into the European Union. Um, but the, the French kept on saying no. And the reason for that is that the, the French have a huge Muslim population and they didn't want to see any more Muslims, in, in effect, in the European Union. Uh, you know, plus there's the geography. Most of Turkey is in Asia Minor. And so, you know, ethnically, um, that you know. um, so so uh, they've turned Turkey's turned its back on us now, and they're they're moving towards Asia. They're moving towards uh, you know Russia. They've they've already um, uh, signed uh, a deal with Russia on the southern pipeline, new southern pipeline, which Turkey's going to pick up a lot of income on the flows that go through that pi pipeline. I have no doubt that Russia will want to extend that through Greece or through that way. Um, and uh, there is the possibility, if you like, of, uh, some, of, of deals with Greece on that basis. Um, I, I think the idea of Greece integrating with Russia more, I see that as unlikely because uh, if Turkey's already going in that direction, I think there'd be quite a lot of opposition, if you like, um, uh, in, in, in Greece to getting into some sort of mm -hmm. Um, alliance, if you like, um, uh, which involves Turkey. So, so it's, it's none of this is a done deal. To, uh, but immediate, more immediately, of course, Greece has got a big, big problem, and that is um, uh, trying to well originally get rid of the troika, but basically yes. renegotiate the terms uh, onto a basis which she could actually deliver and um, have a chance, if you like, of coming out um, in reasonable shape. And uh, I think that their negotiating stance has been very good in doing that. What they've done is they've managed to put off the deadline by about four months. Now, whether in those four months they can uh, improve their negotiating position much more will remain to be seen. But against this background, um, I think that what the finance ministers in Europe are going to be waking up to is that. Um, the euro is actually being undermined by this process very, very significantly. Now, they're in a position where I don't think they can win because um, the best thing for Greece to do, uh, I think, is to leave the eurozone. I don't think the Greeks look at it that way um, because it's deliberately destructive, if you like, in the sense that you're destroying bad banking and malinvestments. You're facing up to reality. It's rather like admitting I'm bankrupt. I have got to do something about my situation. I can remain with, you know, fending off creditors forever, or I can just put my hands up and say, okay, I give in, and then I can get on with life. Yeah? Yeah. That's the position the Greeks are in. Okay. And, and, I would, you know, if if a, if if a, if a Greek minister asked for my advice, I would say what you've got to do, I think, is face the reality, which Varoufakis has done. I mean, you know, he said we're bust. You know, he's 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 gone that far. But I think we've got to take it one step further because the moment they leave the eurozone, they and, and default, they're going to be something like six hundred and fifty billion better off. And the the losers in this are basically are the banking system. Uh, for for which I really don't think that Greece should shed any tears whatsoever. None, not a single one. Yeah. Um, no. I mean, the situation they're in at the moment is that they have got horrendous levels of unemployment. Um, the, I mean, the whole thing, this whole thing of austerity has not worked for them. And the reason it's not worked is because the austerity has been forced down by the government into the private sector. And um, they haven't been able to carry it politically either. Uh, it's, it's very important, I think, to differentiate between the sort of austerity which has hit Greece and to a degree has hit Spain and Italy as well, and the sort of austerity that we've been uh, indulging in in this country, in the UK. What we've done is we've actually cut government spending. Well, actually, we haven't cut government spending. What we've done is we've cut the planned increases in government spending. Thank you. What this has meant is that there is a shift uh, uh, going on in the economy from um, you know, a, a large public sector getting less large and therefore the private sector 
getting larger as a, you know as, as a portion of the whole pie now um, the larger the private sector you have the better the economy is going to be because government is a drag on the, on, on the economy in the case of Greece and, uh, and and the Mediterranean countries what has happened is instead of shrinking the government sector they've shrunk the private sector so it's hardly surprising that austerity there has been an abs absolute death for those economies. The amount of um, government debt that has increased in those economies has just been absolutely um, horrendous. Uh, and they've squeezed, they've just squeezed the private sector the whole time. So that's, that is really what Greece has got to escape from. So long as she's in the Eurozone, her private sector is going to continue to be squeezed and she's going to have unemployment rates of youth unemployment 50%. Unemployment rate generally twenty five percent, thirty percent. I mean, this wow. is this is awful. This is absolutely awful. No, really. um, and uh, you know, and no prospect of it really improving. And you know, the trouble is that nobody within the system actually understands economics. They're macroeconomists uh, in the Keynesian or monetarist mold uh, who just do not understand the complete lack of validity underlying their theories. And uh, so. It's hard to see how anyone can escape from this. But Varoufakis, I think, might be able to do it. But what he's got to do, I think, he's got to bite the bullet and say, right, this is not working for us. Um, you know, we've got to face up to reality and then we can start again. And if he does that, then um, it's the implications as far as the Eurozone are concerned <laughs> are extremely important. Because the first thing we have to consider is what confidence... Uh, is left in the euro itself, um, and if if that confidence is eroded by this uh, process, then that actually could be very serious. You could rapidly see the euro drop to beneath one to the dollar, um, and uh, I suspect also that uh, you will have other movements in Spain and Italy and Portugal beginning to agitate uh, for um, you know a similar type escape because it is. Absolutely obvious, and it will be even more obvious if, if Greece le leaves uh, the eurozone. That uh, you know there is a far greater cost remaining in the eurozone to being out of the eurozone. The, on the political side, as far as Spain, Italy, and France in particular, they all have something similar to Syriza, if not Syriza itself, and they're they're divided. I mean, you've got some that are on the left side, you've got some that are on the right side, but they're all calling for the same thing. Get us out. We want out. And they yes, are, they're gaining, they're gaining prominence. This is, this is true. I, I would though draw a distinction between uh, an opposition party uh, in between um, general elections. I mean, in the case of France, it's Marine Le Pen's um, party. Um, you would have to draw a distinction, I think, between the popularity that such a party enjoys sort of mid-term, um, when everybody's sort of not liking the status quo, you know, think the, they see the government making an absolute pig's ear of it and all the rest of it. They're revolting in this case against Brussels as well. It's a completely different thing when you say to people, right, okay, um, <laughs> here's an election, you know, are you going to, um, you know, be serious in this? Yeah. Uh, or are you going to back off? And um, basically, people back off because what they don't want is the uncertainty of a liquidation, if you like, which is essentially what Europe uh, is trying to put off. You don't see Marine uh, Le Pen uh, popularity sus sustaining itself through the election. Well, I, I mean, uh, whether it'll be enough to keep a, you know, to, to for her to form a government, um, I at this moment I don't really see that. Uh, because what what tends to happen in an election is that people polarize back into the parties uh, or supporting the parties which they would normally support we uh, will we'll see all i'm saying is that uh, you do tend to find that support for parties like that tends to drop off in a general election so you know we're going to have pro we, we've got lots of political risk here and so far yes. markets are just completely ignoring it um, it's, you know, it's which, amazing which, which is amazing but then you know i think um, the point about markets at the moment is they they are ignoring risks again. I mean, you know, this this to me is uh, sort of pre Lehman type um, psychology. Yes. Uh, you know, the, 
there is no such thing as systemic risk. The central banks control everything. Why should we worry about these things? The markets are going up. Stay in them. Yeah. <laughs> All is well. <laughs> All is well. <laughs> Nasdaq five thousand. Woohoo! Yeah, and if you if exactly, you know, I mean, it's um, <laughs> it's it's extraordinary. Never mind that short fuse that's been lit. <laughs> Pay well, no attention to that. <laughs> What fuse? I mean, you know, we we have these problems all the time. So why, you know, why pay attention to them? <laughs> you know, you're, Alistair, it's it's been a pleasure speaking with you, and and I really appreciate all the all the wisdom and the knowledge and getting everybody caught up on what's going on with with the gold market in particular, and what's going on in Europe, and with the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. I'd really like to have to do a show with you and Dave Kranzler and heard Ferguson to do just the to just discuss the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. The three of you know more about it than I believe just about anybody out there. And it would I think it would be great to have the three of you guys on to just discuss that, what's going on and what you see and what you know about that, because they're the implications of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the SCO, are huge. They're starting to be seen, and the Chinese in particular are making their presence more known on the global stage as far as the uh, as far as economics and as far as their currency is concerned. And they, these are these are things that that people need to know about. They they really do. They may not think oh, indeed. They do, but... I, I I have a small anecdote before we go. Actually, okay. I interviewed uh, the historian Neil Ferguson. I don't know, do you know who I mean by Neil Ferguson? No, sir. Uh, he's he's um, he's a professor of history at uh, uh, one of the colleges in Oxford, um, mm -hmm. and a frequent broadcaster. Um, he's a China watcher and all the rest of it. I mean, very well known figure, commands big fees to speak. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I interviewed him in Vienna. Uh, must have been about two and a half years ago. I think two and a half, three years ago, and. Um, I, I asked him because you know he'd recently done a series of um, programs for the BBC on China, so I thought, well, he'd know about this. Uh, and uh, so I said, Neil, what do you think about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization? And he said, and this is the you know this is recorded, so I'm not um, I'm not you know sort of just just sort of, you know um, I'm not giving away any any confidences or anything like that because we this we, we recorded this, uh, and he said, well. Um, you know, when it sort of first came out, we thought it was potentially exciting, but actually it seems to have rather died a death. And <laughs> people are not really. <laughs> so there we are. There we are. It's died a death and people are, <laughs> yes. don't seem to be paying attention to it? No. <laughs> there we are. Anyway. Okay. Uh, it's been great talking to you. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that would be very nice with um, with TF and... Uh, <laughs> and Dave Kranzler. I think that yeah, would be a good idea. I think it would, I think it would be awesome. Yeah. And well, we've been speaking with Alistair McLeod from goldmoney.com and financeandeconomics.org. And Alistair, I certainly appreciate all your time and all your wisdom, and I look forward to speaking with you soon. That's a great pleasure. Thank you very much indeed, Rory. Thank you. <laughs>